Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. They have three very different services. The first service is this little tiny chapel that is completely packed with people. There's 70 people, but they're all in like, if 70 people were in this side of the church and they sit very close to each other. And then the second service they have is in their sort of fellowship space and it has a complete gospel choir. It's the most confusing thing you've ever seen. A lot of their uh, more elderly people love to go to what's kind of a more gospel service. And then their third service was the most intimidating for me because it is in a chapel that looks a lot like the chapel at Duke Divinity School. It is a huge and gothic and you wear these huge robes and everyone process in and it's very serious and you have to climb into the pulpit. I'm not kidding. Climb into the pulpit. And if you've seen it, uh, the pulpit was made in England and so it's been chiseled away. It's beautiful. This building must have cost millions of dollars. And as I climbed into the pulpit, I kept thinking, like, this is not going to work out well. Because as you guys know about me, this is hard enough for me to stay in this area, like, to stay in this area. And they said it was so funny because I'm so small. And so I was trying to, like, get towards the people who were really far away. And so I ended up on the edge of the pulpit preaching as I'm, like, leaning out in my robe preaching to people. Because I felt so far from people because I think... Really, when we talk about preaching, when we talk about what we are as community, I love to be close to people. I like to be around people. It was so great to see the different iterations of the kingdom of God. And that's kind of what we got going on here um, in our place and space. And so I'm just really, really grateful to be back and speaking with you. Now, as we look at this verse, we're starting a series. And if you didn't notice by our um, very subtle bulletin that we're talking about money, Isn't it very subtle? I thought this was the best cover of a punk rock album, which is why I think I chose this one. David does incredible. He always gives me different versions to look at. And this is the one that just really stuck out to me. We're going to talk about how there's little things that add up to big things. And and whether you are part of this church community, whether you are not, you know that God really actually talks about money. As much as I don't love talking about money God talks about money because money is not ethically neutral. What we do with our money, how we spend our money is not ethically neutral. Money's always been something that I, I've been a little bit afraid of in some ways. And, and that almost can get a little sinful because I tend to be uh, so afraid of making sure that I'm going to have enough. Um, I work in a field where um, pastoral ministry is, it's very, I make a lot of money. Um, and I live in an area that, it, no, I, you don't, I always have known that I was going to have to stretch the dollar uh, further than than a lot of my friends. I remember when I got into Duke Divinity School telling one of my best guy friends who is in business, I said, I got into Duke and he said, that's awesome. You're going to make so much money. And I said, that's not what I got in for. And he's like, then why would you go to a school that costs so much? And I was like, great question. And I had no answer. But as I sort of have been thinking through why there is so much fear for me, I think sometimes I live in this, uh, kind of an idea of abundance and scarcity. I tell this story quite often because it happened a couple years ago. One of my best friends, his name is John. Uh, he is my best guy friend. He is a huge goofball, but he's also very, very deep. And I remember one time we were uh, sitting on a couch. We had been roommates for a couple years. There was a big group of us that lived in a house back in the day in the back bay. And we were all hanging out. And I had really felt, I had watched a documentary about Uganda. And I really felt like I was being called to go to Uganda. And I didn't know why. And it was one of those things where I felt like God just kept bringing Uganda in front of me. It was right um, as the first documentary from, um, we're kind of coming out about the child soldiers. And I just felt like for some reason I needed to go to Uganda. And even though I had studied what I call poverty tourism, which is what sometimes, uh, you know, short-term missionary work can look like just going to see, but there is some power to that. So I was really confused about why I was being called to Uganda, but I felt this deep sense. 
So then I went to a worship service. At that time, I was a pastor at another church, but I was attending another church because I really liked the music, if I'm honest. And so I was attending this other church, and the preaching was really good. And uh, all of a sudden, they said, we are hosting a, a meeting for people who are interested in going to Uganda. And my best friend looks and hits me, and I'm like, oh, what does this mean? He said, it means you should go to the meeting. And so I went to the meeting. And I was sitting on the couch, and this is like two years after seminary, so I'm really, I at one point had $12 in my bank account. Um, don't worry, I got better. But I grew up in a family where you always pay your credit card bills off, you have no debts. I just grew up with that understanding. If you don't know, Brian will find out soon. When you get ordained, they ask you, one of the questions that they ask you is, are you in debt enough to be embarrassed to yourself or your congregation? To which my friend leaned over and said, well, how, like, what's your level of embarrassment? <laughs> so I grew up just understanding that you had to be very responsible with money. And for me, that meant it was fear-based. And money has always been something I'm afraid of. So I go to my first meeting and they say, we're really excited to have you guys. Just want to let you know that, like, you're going to have to pay $4,000 to go on this trip, which you might have well have said, you're going to have to pay $80,000. $4,000 at that time seemed like so much money to me. And so I was sitting on the couch and I said, John, it's so weird. I feel like God has called me to Uganda, but I just can't afford to go. And he looked at me and he started laughing. He said, you know, you're supposed to raise the money. And I said, I know, there's no way I can raise $4,000. It's so much money. And John, again, started laughing and he said, you're right, Sarah. God doesn't have enough money for you to go to Uganda. If he's called you there, he's not going to provide and walked away. And in his usual, like, wonderful theological moment, I thought, what am I saying about God that I feel absolutely called to this thing, but I think there's no way. Within a week, I'd raised twice the amount. I'm not a prosperity gospel pastor, so I'm not going to tell you that if you ask for it, you're going to get twice as much. But in that moment, I was taught a lesson that sometimes my fear of finances prevents me from doing what the kingdom of God is asking of me. Wonderful relationships developed out of my trip to Uganda. It's still one of the most profound times that I ended up going back with another organization another time. And it has been a huge lesson for me about what it means to be serious about finances, but also to really take into account that we're dealing with a kingdom ethic, that God's uh, way and economy is different than our way. And if I just try to avoid money, that's not actually being authentic or honest about what uh, God is calling us to. As we look at this scripture this morning, it's a really interesting story because you have to remember we're being told this story, but we also have Joseph from the Old Testament where we were told that we were to store up grain. And so here is an example where we're not to store up grain because in order you're storing up. And so I think as we look at this series, we're going to look at three things. And, you know, we talk about this being a United Methodist Church often. Uh, this comes out of a tradition that was started by a man named John Wesley. He is in no way a saint or someone that we worship, but instead someone who sort of guides our philosophy sometimes. And he said three things about money, and they're going to be a little shocking, so get ready. Gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Now, why is that shocking? Well, gain all you can does not seem like a Christian ideal, does it? Particularly when weighed against the scripture that we just heard that said, don't store up all your treasure here. Instead, store it in heaven. I love when it said, uh, don't have a purse that will wear out. That really related to me. The second part is to save all you can. Well, that doesn't make sense. What if we're supposed to be caregiving for people? And then the third part is give all you can. But if I give all I can, I've got nothing. So what is this all about? I think if we're going to look at scripture over the next couple of weeks, and we're just starting today by talking about gaining all we can, is that we have to understand that gaining, saving, and giving are never meant to be done apart from each other. Why do we try to do well or, or gain all that we are able to, all that's in our ability to do? Well, well, Wesley was suggesting that when we do that, we then are able to save and give, and it's a cycle of being able to be financially responsible. 
Not talking about money doesn't make it go away. It is part of our system. And money itself is not evil, but what we do with it can be. But also what we do with it can be good. John Wesley said, money is the most compendious instrument of transacting all manner of business. And if we use it according to Christian wisdom of doing all manner of good. Money can be a resource we use to do good. But we have to remember that we need to gain. And, and you have to think about, what does that mean? Does that mean that all of us need to be out making sure we're uh, doing a, a job that makes the most amount of money for us? No, no. But even Jesus, as he traveled, had folks that went with him that had money. And even though there are scriptures that remind us that, you know, getting into heaven for a rich person is as hard as getting a camel through the eye of a needle, right? And we know, and we'll talk a little bit about that story at another time, but even though that's happening, Jesus is surrounded by the wealthy as well as the poor because we are all needed in the kingdom of God. This is a a story Jesus is talking to people, and most of the people he's talking to, what wealth looked like was actually having another coat. They didn't have the abundance that we have. I was explaining to some of my friends actually from Uganda that we have storage units, and it blew their mind. What do you mean you have a storage unit? Well, we pay money to put the things that we have too much of and then we put them in a, in a, and then what happens with, why is it there? Who uses it? Well, it's, no one uses it while it's there. It's just, we, when we need it, it's going to be there. And so we have a storage unit of the things that we don't have in our home because we don't have room for them in our home because we have so much stuff. My friend Faith said, being American is too complicated. You see, we, we know that we are constantly told that we need to gain more, get more. You know, we have affluenza, as some people call it. We just more, 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 because we live in this scarcity fear. Like, what if it runs out? Like, what if I don't have enough? And, and I understand that. I had grandparents who were in Europe during World War II to, to hoard things, to hold on to things. But if we believe in the abundance of God, as as John says, you're right, God doesn't have enough money to do that. I'm reminded of that story, even as I look at this community and this church and what we're doing, it has been a difficult process of figuring out how do we work with what we have and yet dream for what is coming? How do we fix what needs to be fixed? Because I've seen the churches that have just been left to disrepair and fall apart. Well, how do we believe that God has something more? We have to believe that we are called to gain In order to give. It can never just be about gaining. Wesley said these words in the 18th century when um, (laughs) it was a time very similar to ours in some way. It was a time when it seemed like everything was falling apart and the budget wasn't working out. It was a difficult time. And Jesus himself is speaking to a time when money seems to be running things. It's almost as if there will be no time when it doesn't seem like money is a big issue. I think there is no disconnect between our faith on Sundays and our financial decisions that we make every day. What does it mean to gain all we can? Well, again, it doesn't mean that we're just gaining for ourselves. It means that we're gaining in order that we can help provide for others. And we all have different seasons. We know this. We have times when we can't find a job. And in no way is God angry at us for that. The abundance is still there. So what can we give? One of the things that is so beautiful to me about this community is that you all give at different levels and different things. It may just be that you give of your time. It may be that you give of your plants. It may be that you give of your space. Whatever it is, we give of what we have. Consider the ravens. In antiquity, the ravens were regarded as careless, for they did not ever return to their nests. They were sort of a careless bird. They never stored or gained and so we're to think about them and yet god cares for them so however our financial situations might be right now whether we are a raven or we're a bird that does a great job of storing their nest god cares for us 
But as we look at responsibility in the next couple of weeks, as we look at what does it mean to be a faithful giver, a faithful participant in the kingdom of God, I don't want us to be afraid that God doesn't have enough. So many of us are living as I was living with this this fear. But that is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, we're told, looks like freedom. The kingdom of God looks like the Lord's Supper. We're going to take the meal now together. And we're going to do so because really it's another example of abundance. God, um, in, in this moment, we are reminded of the stories, not just of the story of Israel uh, who are given the Passover meal, but also the story of the loaves and fishes where what little bit God takes and turns into abundance. And so this morning, wherever you might be feeling financially burdened, feeling like you're living in a place of abundance, feeling confused about what God is asking you to give and do, would we take this meal as an open symbol of grace? That God is with us in these decisions. That God is with us in this space. And even as a church, as we just seek to say, God, we're going to believe that you're doing something and we're in the midst of it. Would we remember the wise words of my theologian friend? You're right. God doesn't have enough money. What does it look like to trust?